Hey everybody, Darren Burroughs here. Today I'm with Steve Arneson of The Reinvestors. Steve and I are gonna talk about three main subjects today. We're gonna to talk about development. What is land development? Steve's also gonna run us through how he presents to find investment capital. And the third thing we're gonna look at is an actual deal that Steve and Randy have on the table when it comes to land development. Before we get into it with Steve, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for Steve, Randy, or myself. Without further ado, let's get into it. Steve, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to be here with us. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do as a real estate investor. Darren, I'm stoked to be here. Uh, what we do, so we are the owners and founders of a company called The Reinvestors. And how I like to say it is that we are a real estate inspiration company. And so we've been operating here in Victoria, BC for the last five years. I've been investing for about eight and uh, the other better part of the business here is Randy, and he's been uh, investing for about that as well. And so we typically do joint venture partnerships on buy and hold properties, but over the years, as the, uh, the market has really appreciated, we found that uh, it's, there's more opportunity in the land development space. And so this is really an area that uh, we spent a lot of time and focus in over the last few years and really excited about the growth that we're seeing here on Vancouver Island in BC and the opportunity that comes with it. I sat in on your presentation the other night of this project that you've got coming up. And after seeing you walk through the presentation, I thought what a great uh, opportunity to show uh, my audience what it looks like, first of all, a land development deal, and second of all, how you put together your presentations. And I thought the easiest way for us to do that was for actually to go through your presentation and talk a little bit about it because it's so well put together. Tell us a little bit about what is land development. Yeah, so in its simplest form, land development is just the acquisition of one or multiple lots. And it can be raw land or already used in existing land. And then you go through the process of clearing existing materials or buildings, could be rock, could be tree, could be garbage, could be you know, an existing house or trailer or something along those lines that are already on it, some sort of dwelling. And then you go through that prep site of side of things where you're preparing the land for the actual raw construction of things. You go through the actual building and then you're at that point of, depending on if it's a buy and hold or if it's sale product, you either sell the units or you buy and hold and uh, you have occupancy and rent it out as you know, a, uh, a passive investment. So that's the, the gist of the full landscape of real estate developing. Why do you like development? And I think you're, that's what your next slide is here. So I'm gonna throw this up on the screen. Yeah, I like development uh, for a couple of different reasons. I find that there's a little bit more control with development in the sense that, you know, if you're working with a 19, you know, early 1900s home, you're really confined to what that space is. Whereas with development, you have a blank slate and you can create whatever the city bylaws allow you to create. Uh, you're also dealing with a brand new product versus an old, uh, you know, possibly, you know, worn and torn type of product. And then as you look at development and when you work with the right type of team and as you find the right types of deals, development can actually be way more lucrative than any other type of real estate investing that we've, that we've been a part of. So in, in those real areas, that's, that's where we like to be. And uh, the, the thing that I also really like about the development and how we structure our deals is we are all as the developer, uh, you know, us as the investment expert and our, uh, our investors, we are all sharing in the ownership. And that can be different than, you know, joint venture partnerships or some private lending. And when you share in that ownership side of things, you get to ride that wave of whatever upside you can create. And so if we as developers are thinking, hey, the average cost per square foot is gonna be 230, but we come down at, you know, 200, the investors also get to be uh, participants in that additional revenue. And that's where we can really start to see, you know, these above 20% returns to, uh, to investors. I know, the, I know the inherent sort of uh, risks of development, and that is probably the biggest ones are early on, right? Uh, in a lot of cases, you're taking raw land that may not be zoned for um, the actual permitted, like the permitted use that you're hoping to do in the future. So how do you guys get around that? How do you um, essentially allow your investors to feel somewhat secure in the process of land development uh, when there are some, some issues in the beginning that can arise. The, the biggest kind of risks when you're getting into the development is that pre-development space. 
you have, you know, for example, maybe you're doing a land assembly and you're tying up multiple pieces of dirt and then you're going to go through that rezoning process or you need to go through, you know, uh, feasibility studies and environmental uh, exams and, and um, you have a bit of an unknown timeline with all of that and you have a lot of big expenses that come through. And so uh, what your big risk in that space is, is the city and the community around you have a very strong opinion on if your development moves forward or not. And so within development, and when you look at you know, cities, they have what's called an uh, official community plan. And so if you're looking at your whole city, there's a little like micro neighborhoods within all of that. And for each little micro neighborhood, there's always a plan. And we as developers have to fit within that plan. If we don't, it's an uphill battle. Even if we do fit within that plan, we have to post, you know, an 800 meter radius. Hey, we're going to be building, you know, a, a four story, 37 unit building here. And all of the residents and business owners can uh, go to council and say, hey, I am in or not in favor of this project. And so you might have huge costs of tying up, you know, a couple lots that are all a couple hundred thousand dollars each, plus the expenses that you're going through for the studies and for the reporting and, you know, uh, the regulatory processes and all those permits have, have expenses as well. So you might be a couple hundred thousand, if not more, out of pocket with the hope and a prayer that the community and the council uh, and staff are going to approve your project. Mm -hmm. And so that's typically that big, um, that big risk. Once you get past that process where you have your development permit approved and your build permit approved, the risk at that point is actually quite low. Mm -hmm. And so all you're really risking after that point is construction, marketing, and sales. And so if you're working with an experienced team who already has all those numbers dialed in for the construction side of things, and you're in you know, a good market, and you're working with good realtors, and you have staff on the development team to sell, uh, to, to sell the product, then you're really minimizing that, that risk. And so that's where we like to play in is the, the developments that we usually take on, they've already, somebody else has already taken them through that pre-development space. And so often for like other wholesalers or other developers, architects, people in that industry, they'll put all that upfront capital out and they'll take on that risk and you know, put a couple of different lots together, get everything approved, and then wholesale that or sell that to a developer who just wants to come in and build the thing. And that's mm -hmm. where we come in is getting rid of all that initial risk just so that we can have uh, a more stable product um, uh, and timeline and, and better offering for, for everybody involved. Who took it to the point where it is now, Steve? So it's a, it's a 30 year vet architect and developer here in Victoria that took it through the process and a large part of his business, pro, um, large part of his business plan is exactly this, get things approved and ready and then off sale it to, to the next person. Cause his, his real expertise isn't the construction side of things and the sales side of things. It's more so the regulatory process. Mm. So he's fitting in within his niche and then we get to fit within our niche. So tell us about this, this newest uh, venture, uh, Skyview. Yeah, so we as the reinvestors are partnering with a development company called TLA. And uh, we've been working together on a couple other projects and, and we have a great relationship together. And this one here is in an extremely great location uh, between the fastest growing municipality in British Columbia and the downtown core of the capital of BC, Victoria. And so it's called Skyview, and this is a rendering from, you know, from the front side of the building. And, uh, you know, it's, it's modern, it's sleek, yeah, it's a little contemporary, it's beautiful. And it's really going to fit in well with this kind of West Coast lifestyle. And we have a lot of amenities around us. Um, and, you know, we'll put in, you know, car share and bike storage and, you know, we'll be with the times for, you know, West Coast lifestyle. So walk us through this one. So 37 unit condo building in, in, um, in Victoria. Uh, shovel ready, which is, I think is a, is a big plus, uh, development permits approved, building permits approved. Uh, obviously you've got a solid market in Victoria. A lot of people, especially right now, I think looking to move, um, West for sure, uh, to nicer climates. I think also to, to, uh, to smaller centers. A lot of people are looking to downsize. Um, you have a five-star, uh, track record with your development partner. This is TLA, I'm guessing. Yeah, so TLA's background and, and track record is is extremely great. And then ours here being like the, the Vancouver Island experts of investment, you know, we complement each other quite well. And the, the shovel ready piece is, is really one of the key pieces that we uh, like to highlight is because it already has the permitting in place, we're eliminating that risk. 
And then I think I have a slide a little bit further down uh, that I'll show you why the location is so great as well. Mm. And then in everything that we do, we always have you know very conservative numbers in the sense that we're over projecting what our costs are going to be and under projecting what our revenues are going to be. And so we want to make sure that we can deliver the investment that we're talking about. And that's one of the ways that we do that. So talk about the $100,000 minimum and the difference between accredited and exempt investors. Why is your minimum $100,000? Like, why can't, if I had five friends and we all wanted to put in you know, $20,000 each, why can't we do that in this project? Yeah, so there, there are great funds out there that allow that. And for us, uh, the more people that we bring in, the more management we have to do you know, to make sure that those investors are satisfied with the information on an ongoing process. Like this is a two year project. And if I have to communicate to a hundred people versus communicating with 10 people, that's a lot more management on my end. And so to, to make it more efficient and to make the whole process easier, we kind of set a little bit of a higher standard. And then when you get into the accredited side of things and the exempt side of things, that's how we as the reinvestors can actually take in money we can't go soliciting just to the public. We have to specifically work within the BC securities guidelines. Mm. And to do that, we have to work with accredited investors or exempt investors. And the exemptions typically are just friends, family, and business associates. And there's a couple other nuanced ones as well in there as well. And then on the accredited side, you have to meet certain standards from each different province has their own regulations, but it's usually something along the lines of like, you have to have $5 million in net worth or your your liquid assets have to be about a million dollars. You have to have two hundred fifty thousand dollars as a as a you know single income or three hundred thousand as a, a joint income with your spouse. Amazing. Let's go on. I, I love these renderings. It's such a beautiful building. Um, save me a sweet. Uh, so talk about the uh, the actual the breakdown of units. Yeah, and so I think what we've all recognized over the last you know six months from the pandemic is that more and more people want more and more space. Mm -hmm. And there was a trend there a few years ago where we were getting into like those micro units, you know, 250, 300 square feet. That's no longer the case. And so we've had to pivot with the times. And, you know, thankfully this split is uh, a good balance for the extra space where you can work life kind of all in one area. And so uh, the majority of these 37 units is one bed and den. So you can throw an office or something along those lines or two bedrooms. And so that you can either share space, you know, uh, have a roommate to, uh, to reduce your costs or be able to, you know, start thinking ahead uh, in your, you know, for me kind of thing. If you're, if you're looking at having a kid soon, you know, having that extra space is, is really key these days. And um, so it's in a prime location. We're going to have one, uh, one level of underground parking and then four above grade. And it's just your standard, you know, uh, conventional wood frame building. We're not doing anything, uh, too aggressive or, or special about it. Uh, for this one, like we'll have some, some higher end finishings as well to keep it, you know, contemporary and modern. Um, but one thing that we're seeing more and more demand on is the you know, one bed and den or two bedrooms because living and working with a spouse in a single bedroom, you know, if you're both got nine to fives and you're both hustling, uh, hustling and grinding, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, um, then you want to have that, that separate space. What do you like about this site versus some of the other projects that you might have seen come across your desk recently? Yeah, so it's extremely central. And so for anybody who doesn't know like the Victoria area, uh, there's a few key kind of spaces within it. And this is right within the middle. So on your east side of the green dot is the downtown Victoria core. And on the west side of the green dot is the Langford and Colwood area, which is the west shores of Victoria. And that's the fastest growing municipality in all of British Columbia. And so we're right between the capital hub and the fastest growing area. And so View Royal, which is in this municipality, uh, they've become much more development friendly over the last few years, which is great for, for us as developers and for you know, future homeowners because the demand in Victoria is crazy high and we're not keeping up with it right now. So we need to build more housing. And then even more on a granular level, like within a walking distance, all of that darker gray, that's all ocean. And mm -hmm. so you're literally like a 10 minute walk away from some nice beaches. Uh, you know, all the little black dots that you see are, you know, clinics, restaurants, schools. Uh, you can walk to Victoria General Hospital, which is the, the largest hospital here in Victoria. You're on major bus routes to some key piece, uh, pieces as well, like the Esquimalt Navy Base. Um, you know, downtown's only a few minute drive away. 
uh, and then we can also cater towards uh, students as well because we're only a few minute drive away from uh, University of Victoria and then the colleges and some other universities around the area. So when we are doing these type of projections where we're thinking, okay, where are, gonna, where are people going to want to be in two years? View Royal in this location specifically is easily on that hot list. And one other thing I'll say too is uh, Skyview is actually on the top of a hill. And so you're gonna have some really incredible views of some, some ocean space on the north side, uh, as well as some city and, and mountain views as well uh, on the upper levels. I guess that explains the name, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, for, for folks putting together presentations, not only talk about your building, but also what else is out there and what, you know, so that it's not something that people are just plucking numbers out of the air. I think this is really a great slide. And you have two of them, I think, in here, but we'll just kind of skip past them. Because I want to dive into another view of the building, which is, this is phenomenal. Um, I want to just talk about the numbers, because for those people looking to do investment projects, for those people looking to invest in development projects, walk us through these numbers and what they mean on your project. Yeah, so we had to buy the land and the uh, development permits uh, around that 2.7 area. And so that's our initial upfront cost. That's the, the cost you have to put up right away. And then you get into that soft cost things where you're getting some more reporting done, you know, your, your permitting fees, uh, staffing, et cetera. And then the financing costs we kind of have is just a, a general average at that 400,000. Contingency, you always got to make sure your contingency is, is buffered. And I've already explained that like, we already have a contingency baked into our numbers themselves. Our sales prices are lower than what we expect and our cost per square foot to build is higher than we expect. But not only that, we also have a half million dollars set aside just for a whole bunch of what ifs. Mm -hmm. And then you get into that cat one, two, three uh, expenses, which are your hard costs. And so that category one stuff is like your, your materials, your, your labors, uh, all of the stuff that you actually see going up. And then the category two is like the rental equipment, renting cranes, you know, excavators, uh, that kind of stuff. And then uh, the category three side of things is some offsite building costs. So when you get into the offsite stuff, it's great because you get to, you know, build walls in a controlled environment instead of, uh, you know, building in the rain here under mm -hmm. a warehouse. And so the, the material is, is actually uh, stronger and better put together. And so we'll be doing a little bit of that on this project. And then all encompassing, we're, we're just over the $12 million mark. For a lot of people, something they've probably never seen before, a project, project of this size, at least like really the breakdown of the numbers. And thanks so much for, for sharing this with, uh, with us. Um, let's go to the next one because we've, uh, you're now going to look at the projected returns uh, and what it looks like for your investors. Yeah, so brief summary, like 2 million to start, 2.7 to start. And then we've got our average cost per square foot there you know, at about 270, you know, totaling the just over 12 million on, on the costs. And then our estimated sales pricing, our revenues that we're expecting are, you know, 18.7 million, you know, easy math, you take one, you minus the other, and it gives us a $6.5 million uh, gross profit to the project. And then when we take those profits uh, and you break them down, um, that's probably my biggest question always is how does it work? Who gets paid? Who, how does the developer get paid? How do you get paid? How does everybody profit in this scenario? So walk us through this. Yeah. And so how we like to do things is we want to have everybody have skin in the game. So we want to have our developer have skin in the game. We want to have skin in the game and we want to give our investors, you know, an equity position. So they have skin in the game and they can ride that upside that we mentioned earlier. And so for this particular one, we have a limited partnership agreement between uh, our investors and us. And then we have a agreement between us and TLA, the development, which states that, hey, we have a 20% equity in this development company. And so the investors have ownership, we have ownership, and TLA, our development team, has ownership as well. And that ownership gives you all that upside. And then on the limited partnership side of things, uh, there's no, like your limited liability. So there's no like future consequences that can come to the partners only to the TLA side of things. So you're limiting that long-term risk and just capitalizing on the, the growth opportunity of the development. And so in this particular case, uh, the development makes, you know, 6.5 and change. The GPLP, the general partner and limited partnership uh, gets 20% of that, which is 1.3 million. And then of that, uh, the investors get 55% of 
which equals the you know, 721,000, which is a uh, annualized return of 24%, and of course, including that 12% that preferred rate of return. Because what's the what's the raise on something like this, Steve? Like, what what kind of capital do you have to get? Because you mentioned about twelve million dollars was your soft costs, uh, or, or sorry, your combined costs. So, how much capital are you looking to raise on a transaction like this? Yeah, so the full amount of capital is about four million, and so we're only bringing a fraction of that to the table. Hmm. We're looking for just one point five on our end, you know, buying into that twenty percent equity. And when we work with investors, like we go to bat for our investors. So we originally had an agreement with TLA saying that we we're going to get 18% for bringing um, 1.5 to the table. Mm. We got to renegotiate with them to be like, hey, we want to do a little bit more for our investors. And we negotiate up to a 20% return, uh, sorry, 20% equity stake in the, in, the, in the company for that. And so we're always, you know, swinging and playing for our investors more than anything. And um, just wanted to put that on the table. Hmm, for sure. So the seven hundred twenty-one thousand dollars in investor return is basically of that one point five million dollars. Is that correct? Uh, that's the return that you would get on the one point five million, correct? Yeah. So that's why you're saying that you know basically it's your uh, it's fifty percent return. You divide that out annually, and it's uh, going to be twenty four percent over those two years. Exactly. Love it. Steve, I think this is uh, so well put together. And I think this is a phenomenal project to just talk about land development, talk about how to present your opportunities to other investors. And then also, um, if there's investors that are interested in this project, they should, what's the best way to get in touch with you guys? Just reach out to you guys directly. And if you want to do another version of the presentation, excuse me, or what else, what, what would you like to do next for your folks that might be interested? Yeah, people are interested. I have a lot more details on this. And so I'm happy to, to set up a phone call or walk through a, a private presentation one-on-one. -on -one. And so the best way to get a hold of me is just through email. And it's simply just my first name, Steve, at thereinvestors.ca. Cool. And I'll leave a link for that in the, in the description below. Um, thanks so much for walking us through that. I think it's really interesting for people to, to wrap their head around development because we see these buildings going up all over the place. And a lot of people probably don't even really understand the process of, you know, talking about all that stuff in the beginning where it's like, you know, there's been a two or three year, sometimes four year process, even to get to the point where they're able to put up that sales center and advertise it. That's essentially that the project's moving forward. And then from there to occupancy or to sale, whatever is another couple of years. Uh, so it's really an interesting process to watch land development, how it all works, but it is a phenomenal way to earn very passively in as a real estate investor. And I think that's one of the things that neither of us have really touched on is that your investors don't have to do anything here. They don't have to deal with tenants. They don't have to um, you know, deal with construction or anything like that. That's all being handled by you guys. And so this is very passive, uh, a great way to make some significant returns on their money and just literally let you guys do all the work. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the better position to be in. I'd much rather be on the <laughs> passive side, but that's, uh, that's a couple of years down the road. But the one thing I just wanted to add into this is this is really a dream come true for me. I wanted to be a developer in Victoria since I was 14 years old. And for about eight years of my life through the, I used to live in the West Shore, commute to town, I would drive by that location. And so I'm really looking forward to, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road or whatever it is. When I have kids sitting in the car, we drive past that. I get to be like, hey, you know what? I built that. And so it, it's really a, 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 a passion project uh, for me as well. And so having that, that kind of emotion in the game um, is, is, a, is a benefit in this hit case because we want to make sure that it's successful. Amazing. Thanks so much for taking some time uh, out of your day. I know you're crazy busy right now, but thanks for walking everybody through this. Uh, I really appreciate it. If you guys enjoyed the session with Steve, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel hit the notification bell and feel free to leave comments, questions for both Steve and myself in the comments section below. You can also check me out on Facebook, Instagram, or follow me on my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Steve, thanks so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I look forward to connecting with you very soon, my friend. Sounds good, Darren. You too.